Good morning, everybody. It is 7 o'clock. You are very welcome to join us on The Breakfast Show here on Sky News. A chilling warning from the head of the army that Britain and its allies face a 1937 moment following President Putin's invasion of Ukraine. On today's programme, we'll be joined by the former head of the British Army, that's General Lord Dunnett, and from the government, the Culture Minister, Chris Philp. Plus, more murmurs of a summer of discontent this morning with a demand from some doctors for more pay and royal mail workers now planning to vote on a strike as well. We'll be talking about that with the union that represents them, the General Secretary of the Communication Workers Union, Dave Ward. Plus, we'll get Labour's take on it all with Tulip Sadiq. It's Tuesday, the 28th of June. Tragedy in a Texas trailer. Three people arrested after 46 people are found dead in a lorry and another 16 taken to hospital, including children. The patients that we saw were hot to the touch. They were suffering uh, from heat stroke, heat exhaustion. Heartless terrorists, Ukraine's president hits out after a Russian missile hits a crowded shopping centre hundreds of miles from the front line. They continue to search through the rubble, but they've told me they don't expect to find anyone else alive as the number of official dead reaches 18. G7 leaders here in Germany have condemned the attack as abominable and said President Putin will be held to account for war crimes. More strike threat as doctors call for a 30% pay rise over the next five years and more than 100,000 Royal Mail workers prepare to vote on whether to walk out. The route map to independence, Scotland's first minister to call for another referendum. But will the government try to stop it? There were wins for Brits Andy Murray, Emma Raducanu and Cam Norrie in the first round at Wimbledon with Rafa Nadal and Serena Williams in action today. Also coming up on the programme for you this morning, six months after her conviction, Ghislaine Maxwell will learn her sentence for sex trafficking later on today. We'll talk to a legal commentator about how long she could face in jail. And snake hips or fake hips? We'll be discussing the controversy around one of the all-time music greats, Elvis Presley. Morning, everybody. We start with the breaking news you're waking up to from overnight. A tragedy in Texas. At least 46 people have been found dead in a lorry trailer. Another 16 have been taken to hospital, including children. Three people have been arrested. The state governor says it appears to be one of the most deadly recent incidents of suspected human trafficking along the border with Mexico. The truck was found in San Antonio, the second largest city in Texas. It's around 150 miles from the Rio Grande Valley, uh, a major crossing route between the US and, Mox and Mexico, as our US correspondent Martha Kellner reports. They came presumably in search of brighter beginnings, but this is where so many lives reach such a brutal end. The bodies of 46 suspected migrants found inside this lorry in a remote part of San Antonio. We are dealing with a horrific human tragedy so I would urge you all to think compassionately and pray for the deceased, the ailing, the families, and we hope that those responsible for putting these people in such humane conditions are prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. The dozens inside had entered the country illegally. Those who survived were taken to hospitals suffering from heat stroke. Temperatures in this part of Texas on Monday were nudging 40 degrees Celsius. The patients that we saw were hot to the touch. They were suffering uh, from heat stroke, heat exhaustion, uh, no signs of water in the vehicle. It was a refrigerated tractor trailer, but there was no uh, visible working AC unit on that rig. Border officials were already on high alert amid record levels of migrant crossings from Mexico. The tragedy already being politicised. 
Texas Governor Greg Abbott tweeting, these deaths are on Biden. They're a result of his deadly open border policies. They show the deadly consequences of his refusal to enforce the law. This is, it appears, one of the worst instances of migrant death in the US in recent years. An astonishing loss in horrific circumstances. Martha Kellner, Sky News. We'll be updating on what's happening in Ukraine in just a moment. But first, uh, Heathrow Airport must reduce its passenger charges amid a spike in demand for travel. Uh, that's according to the aviation regulator. They have announced that within the last few moments, talking about the Civil Aviation Authority, of course, saying the cap on the West London Airport's average charge per passenger will fall from £30.19 pence today to £26.31. pence. Uh, follows a bitter dispute between the airport and the airlines about what the level should be. The CAA have had enough and they've said, nope, it cannot be what you expect it to be. And as a result, the uh, charge per passenger will fall by 2026. Now, as promised, uh, let's update you on what's happening as far as the situation in Ukraine is concerned. At least 16 people have been killed, dozens injured, after a Russian missile strike on a busy shopping centre in the Ukrainian city of Kremenchuk, hundreds of miles from the front line. Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky has said, fortunately, many people were able to get out from the shopping centre, but he also had this to say. <laughs> Fortunately, as far as we know at this time, many people managed to get out. They managed to get out. But there were still people inside, workers, some visitors, only completely heartless terrorists who should have no place on earth can strike missiles at such an object. And this is not a mistaken hit by missiles. This is a calculated Russian strike at this shopping centre. Sally is in Kremenchuk for us this morning. Hi, as Sally, the latest we're hearing there uh, from the president is he sees this as an act of terror. Yeah, that's right, Kay. Uh, rescuers are continuing to search through the rubble here of the shopping centre, which is completely destroyed. I mean, there's really absolutely nothing left of it, virtually. The entire depth of the building is completely burned out after that huge fire that followed uh, the missile strike yesterday. And rescuers have been working through the night, clearing debris to see uh, if they can recover anyone uh, trapped underneath. I, I spoke to... Uh, one of the rescuers a little earlier, uh, and she said that, that they're not hopeful of finding anyone alive uh, at this stage and that in fact they have found uh, human remains. Uh, so it's very hard for them uh, to get a clear idea of exactly how many people uh, died. Uh, but the official figure that we've been given from the regional governor uh, is 18 uh, so far, and a local police station... Uh, not far from here, is collecting DNA from relatives uh, who've reported uh, loved ones missing since this attack yesterday. Now, we understand around half of this area have been cleared so far. It does feel more like a recovery operation uh, rather than a rescue operation now, but certainly uh, a very grim uh, attack indeed uh, to have happened on this central Ukrainian city just before 4 o'clock in the afternoon yesterday, a busy time. Uh, with lots of people shopping here, uh, lots of families at the supermarket. Uh, and, of course, this is just the latest in uh, a run of attacks on uh, civilian targets. The Russians claim they're not targeting civilian areas, but certainly uh, these, continue, these attacks uh, continue to happen. OK, thank you, Sally. Thank you. Chris Phillip, Minister for Technology and the Digital Economy, is with us. What are we going to do about this? Well, I think the attacks that Russia is carrying out on civilian targets clearly, deliberately, are just sickening and appalling. We saw the attack just there on a shopping centre yesterday, but it's not a one-off. We've seen them over the last three months attacking uh, children's hospitals. We've seen them attacking maternity wings. We've seen them bombing flats. There is apparently no end to the barbarity of Putin's, frankly, criminal regime in the way that they're not only invading a free sovereign country, but apparently intentionally deliberately killing and targeting civilians as well. Uh, I think it was good we saw at the G7 just a couple of days ago, uh, those G7 leaders, including uh, President Macron, following his uh, meeting with our Prime Minister, stating their resolve to stay with Ukraine. I think it's essential we stay with Ukraine uh, throughout this 
uh, invasion. We do everything we can to support them. The UK has provided £1.3 billion worth of support uh, so far. We've provided uh, 5,000 anti-tank missiles. We've provided anti-aircraft missiles. We've provided anti-ship missiles. Uh, we've provided humanitarian aid. We're offering to train 10,000 Ukrainian troops every 120 days. So we, need, we in the West, not just the UK, but the entire West, need to do everything we can, everything, to support Ukraine militarily in this at dark hour which they, which they face. Are we prepared to send troops to Ukraine? No, we said we're not going to do that because we are worried about escalation. And in fact, if you talk to the Ukrainian government, their issue isn't troops. They have a lot of volunteers, uh, young men and women who are volunteering to defend their homeland, uh, as I hope people here would if faced with a similar threat. What they need is equipment, and that is what we're pouring in as quickly as we can. Uh, I would just say to other governments uh, around the world, you know, join, join us in doing that, but do it quickly. There is a sense of urgency here. Uh, we need to support Ukraine, not in a month's time or two months' time. Uh, we need to support them today, so, so time is critical. Is it an act of terrorism, what we saw yesterday? Uh, I would go, yes, I would go that far and say that it is, because it is intentionally targeting civilians. There is no military necessity to bombing a shopping centre, just as there was no military necessity to bombing a maternity hospital, which we saw, um, or that theatre in uh, Mariupol. We saw them bombing that theatre where civilians were taking shelter. It was clearly marked as containing civilians. So um, this is not a one-off act. It's part of a consistent pattern uh, of, of atrocities being committed by the Russian government. Are we ready to go to war with Russia? We're going to hear from the head of the army, the new head of the army, uh, later on today, describing this as our 1937 moment. Well, I think that refers to the fact we need to do everything we can to support Ukraine. We don't want to see an escalation into a wider conflict. I think Russia would be literally insane uh, to attempt to do that because NATO is a far larger and a far stronger bloc. We've seen the Russians have been you know, unable to make significant uh, progress in Ukraine, right? They tried to take Kiev and they were unable to do so. So Russia would be sort of mad to try and take on NATO. We don't think they'll do that. We don't think they should do that. We certainly don't want to see that happen. We think we can... We are prepared for it, though. We, we, we are prepared for anything. Um, but we think we can support the Ukrainian government with the current strategy, which is to give them uh, the weapons they need to liberate their own territory. Are we prepared for it, though? Because uh, the impression that we're getting is that we have something like 40,000 um, war-ready troops at the moment. That is going to be significantly increased, not just in the UK, um, to 300,000. But that's going to take time. That's right. Well, there's obviously a NATO summit um, going on, and I think the, the commitment of NATO nations to uh, protecting uh, the territorial integrity of NATO countries, particularly on that eastern flank, the flank that faces Russia, is clearly more important today than it ever has been before. And I think the uplifting troops that you just mentioned, the, um, the troops who are ready to be deployed, is a signal of the uh, serious commitment that NATO collectively has to defending all of NATO's member states, including those states on the eastern flank. What are we going to do about Putin? If this is an act of terror, then that makes him the arch-terrorist. We could never, ever do business with him again. Well, I think uh, the, the, the Russian uh, regime, Putin's regime, is uh, irreversibly uh, tarnished, and tarnished is too weak a word, by what, what, word they've, use, what they've done. Well, I mean, just disgraced in, in, international, in international eyes. And uh, I think it is difficult to see how uh, we can deal with them ordinarily again, certainly so long as they remain you know, in occupation of a, of a free, democratic, sovereign country. Um, I believe that Ben Wallace um, is going to write to Rishi Sunak and say that we need to um, increase the defend uh, defence spending target to 2.5% of GDP. It's presently at 2%. Um, is that something that you're aware of? Is that something that you would support? Well, I think our spending as a proportion of GDP is, is currently just over 2%, which is the NATO uh, guideline. Many NATO countries, sadly, um, don't spend the two percent, and I think one of the things I, I we would that, one I'm of the things we would we one of the th do. I'm going to come on to that. One of the things we would urge all our NATO allies to do is, is to is to meet that two percent at least. Uh, you know, clearly uh, we have had a good defence settlement uh, just recently. Uh, obviously, ministers, uh, secretaries of state across government make representations to the prime minister and the chancellor around their own budget, and they'll get properly considered at the time of a of a spending review. But this is a government that is committed to our armed forces. That's why. We're above that 2% level. We're about to cut and our troops from 80,000 to 70,000. 
Well, I mean, you look at you look at the way. Well, you look at the way that uh, modern warfare is conducted, and make sure that the money is being spent most effectively. I made the point already in the Ukraine, relation to Ukraine that what they've said is most important are the, are the, are the systems, the weapon systems that are needed to fight, as, w- as well as sure, troops. I understand both that, involved. Minister, but you know, we're again going to hear from the head of the armed services who will tell us that um, cyber security doesn't get you across the river. That's right. I mean, the truth, the truth is you need both. You need the cyber security measures, you need the advanced uh, weapon systems, um, the, the, drone, the impact of drones in the Ukraine conflict has been, I think, far greater than anyone would have anticipated, and you need boots on the ground. The truth is... In a modern theatre, you need all of those things. Okay, talk to me about um, Indie Ref 2. Um, Nicola Sturgeon says it's going to go ahead, whatever the British government thinks. Well, that isn't how the law works. Uh, Referenda and constitutional matters are are reserved. We had a referendum in 2014. The Scottish people delivered their verdict by a fairly clear 10-point margin. Nicola Sturgeon at the time and her then-mentor, Alex Salmond, said very clearly to the Scottish people this was going to be a a once-in-a-generation referendum. It was only a few years ago. That's not once-in-a-generation. I think Nicola Sturgeon should respect the will of the Scottish people that was expressed so clearly in that referendum. And not And it's not once-in-a-generation. And and, um, respect the will of the people in that referendum and focus on the key issues that matter. There was uh, an opinion poll published by YouGov just a few weeks ago showing that only 28% of Scottish people wanted a referendum this year or next. The vast majority did not. And in fact, when they were asked to rank the important issues facing Scotland, another independence referendum was rated seventh, backed by only, or mentioned only so by 16% I mean, if, of the I mean, if that's people. the case, if, they, if you think that the, the Scottish people are not up for it, let them have the referendum. Well, they're not, up, they're not up for having a referendum, right? 28% of people, only 28% of people, said they wanted a referendum this year or next. There are more important issues facing the country and facing Scotland, uh, issues to do with the economy. In, in Scotland, top issues with the economy, health and education. Uh, those are the issues, frankly, that both the UK government and actually the Scottish government, because health and education are completely devolved to the Scottish government, they should be focusing on those issues. You know, Scotland has the highest rate of uh, drug-related deaths in Europe. Those are the things Nicola Sturgeon should be focusing on, not rerunning a referendum that we had just a few years ago and which she told us was a once-in-a-generation referendum. She ought to respect the will of the Scottish people. Sounds like you're telling her how to do her job. I'm telling her just to um, respect the result of a democratic referendum, just as, you know, we, we respect it, we respected the result of the Brexit referendum. You know, democracy only works if you respect the result of the vote you have. OK. Um, you've got uh, quite a lot on your plate as far as the UK government is concerned. Um, strikes by rail workers, airport workers, postal workers are looking at it, teachers are looking at it, barristers are on strike. Mm. How are you going to fend off this summer of discontent? Well, I mean, clearly this has been largely triggered by the inflation figures. Those are, those are global figures. The OECD inflation average is almost exactly the same as the UK average. A C- couple of points. First of all, it's important that we take action to help people get through this, um, what I hope is a short-term situation. So we've got this £37 billion package targeted at people on lower incomes. That's the £400 uh, fuel rebate. It's the £150 off council tax. It's the £650 no, for people on, on, on universal on credit. It's the 5p off fuel duty. So we're doing a lot to help people get through this crisis. Not enough, says Partic- the unions. Well, particularly people on lower incomes. Look, um, I, we're expecting this to be a transitory phenomenon. It's driven by things like the Ukraine crisis, like the COVID situation in China, um, the the, the supply chain issues, those kind of things. So we're expecting this to be something which is uh, transitory. If we have a series of across-the-board pay increases for everybody, then what's going to happen is that will just feed even more inflation. I mean, imagine hypothetically we say tomorrow everybody in the whole economy gets a 9% pay rise, right? which is essentially what these strikes are asking for. If we did that, all that would happen is prices would then jump up by another 9% the day afterwards because companies would have to raise prices in order to um, pay, their, pay those wages, taxes would have to go up to fund it, and to the extent there was excess money floating around in the system, that would drive inflation. So an across-the-board pay increase tomorrow is, is for everybody is not how you beat inflation. We sort of tried that in the 1970s, and you just get into a deathly spiral of wage increases driving more inflation. It's like a dog chasing its tail. We need to help the people that need helping, which we're doing with the £37 billion, get through this, what I hope is a temporary situation, yeah. put in place the measures um, to tame inflation in the longer term, which yeah. is partly monetary measures, so interest rates and quantitative easing. It's partly reform to our economy to make it more efficient. And my job as technology minister uh, covers that. If we can adopt 
technology more widely through our economy, then our economy gets more efficient, and that tends to bring prices down. So there are no there are no sort of easy fixes to inflation. But one thing we should not be doing is having just universal nine percent pay increases because that will make inflation worse and it will make it permanent. Okay. And that is bad for everybody in the. You're economy. going to get me in trouble if you don't stop talking. So Sorry. we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank much you. appreciated as always, Minister. Thank you. Quick look at what's happening as far as the papers are concerned. Uh, the Financial Times leads with the announcement that NATO will increase its forces on high alert sevenfold. The Metro's front page headline, shoppers murdered by Russia. The Sun says beast from the east. That's also the lead in The Times. Boris Johnson has described the shopping centre missile strike attack in Ukraine as appalling, according to the Daily Express. And the lead in The Telegraph as well. Western leaders at the G7 summit in Germany have described the attack on the Ukrainian shopping centre as abominable and said Russia's President Putin will be held to account for war crimes. Let's get uh, more on that. Should we, Siobhan, standing by at the summit's host town in Bavaria this morning? Hello to you, um, Siobhan. Uh, I think, actually, the uh, British Prime Minister also referred to it as stupid. There has been joint condemnation from all of those G7 leaders following that terrible attack yesterday on the shopping mall. And you have to remember that ever since this three-day summit began, there were first, of course, those missile attacks on Kyiv and then followed this attack. And the timing, of course, was on the day when President Zelensky was addressing those leaders, reiterating his demands for more money, more weapons, more support. Uh, and the leaders, as you say, have issued this statement saying that it was an abominable attack, that uh, indiscriminate attacks on civilians are war crimes and that President Putin will be held to account. Now, Boris Johnson has spoken about this as well. He says it's shown the depths of the cruelty of the Russian leader, but also saying that it has strengthened the resolve of those G7 leaders. And we're expecting a final statement this morning, wrapping up this conference. We already know that these leaders are looking at further sanctions, that the US is looking at delivering uh, missile defence systems, that they're looking at trying to help Ukraine get grain out, a possible uh, price cap on oil as well. And the conversation don't stop here. Once they've finished here, those leaders will fly to Madrid, where they'll continue to talk about defence at the NATO summit. OK, Siobhan, thank you. Thanks very much. Boris Johnson and the world leaders will gather today for that final day of the G7 summit. Um, here are the G7 leaders showing a united front. But this has caused quite a bit of reaction on Twitter. Let's take a look. Martha Gill, writer at The Times, tweeted a different image of the leaders saying, hope to live to see the day that a meeting of G7 leaders is mistaken for a hen do. Let me know your reaction by tweet. Uh, you can tweet me directly if you would like to, at Kay Burley. Still to come on the programme. Later this hour, speaking to the NATO former Deputy Assistant Secretary General for Emerging Security Challenges, that's Dr Jamie Shea. Shortly after eight, speaking to the Shadow Treasury Minister Tulip Sadiq as the Labour Party criticises the government's response to Britain's backlogs. And as the new head of the Armoury prepares to say Britain must be ready to act to stop the spread of war in Europe, I'll speak to the former Chief of the General Staff, that's General Lord Dunnett. To Jordan now, where at least 13 people have been killed after a shipping container filled with chlorine fell while being transported. More than 250 injured in the explosion at the port, oh, goodness me, of Aqaba, with the local health minister saying more casualties may be linked to the leak. 25 tonnes of chlorine gas spread across the dock after the container fell from a winch and slammed into the deck of a ship. Doctors are demanding a 30% pay rise over the next five years in a move that increases the chance of industrial action. It comes as 115,000 Royal Mail workers vote on whether to strike in a row over pay. Let's get the latest from Aisha, who's joining us from outside the Department of Health. So the doctors want 30% over five years. 
Yeah, that's absolutely right. And if the government don't commit to that, the British Medical Association say that strike, a strike action is on the cards. It's uh, been a leading story on front pages today. Uh, doctors want to see this 30% increase in pay over the next five years because they say that would make up for the cuts that have been made to uh, real earnings since 2000. And eight. Now, the government is expected to announce its pay award for doctors and dentists uh, soon. So depending on what comes out of that, that, that may well trigger um, an industrial ballot for junior doctors. And doctors are saying that they've been inspired by the RMT strikes that happened last week on the railways. But of course, it's not just RMT we've seen strike recently. BA have recently voted to strike too. There's a threat of strike from BT workers. And uh, hundreds of thousands of Royal Mail workers are preparing to vote on whether or not they should walk out. Uh, now, the, the threat of industrial action is incredibly widespread at the moment, and it leads to the question of whether we are in for a summer of discontent, just like the winter of discontent in the late 70s. Here's a reminder of what that was like. Now is the winter of our discontent. Those words from Shakespeare came to define the winter of 1978 to 1979, a period dominated by some of the most severe strikes in British history. It was a Labour government then, led by James Callaghan, who entered office a year after inflation hit a record high of almost 25%. The new government's aim will be to drive on with the vital job of bringing down the rate of inflation. Callaghan was set on limiting public sector pay rises at 5%, well below inflation. And in 1978, during the coldest winter for 16 years, relations between the government and trade unions froze over. The strike started with lorry drivers, but soon spread to other sectors, including ambulance workers, rail staff and dustmen, leading to this. The winter soon thawed, and after extensive talks with union bosses, the strikes relented. But it spelled the end for the Prime Minister, who lost months later in a general election to one Margaret Thatcher. Four decades on, Boris Johnson will be hoping history does not repeat itself. So will we see a summer of discontent? We'll have to wait to see how things pan out for doctors, but uh, across different sectors as well. OK, thanks so much. Thank you. Now, over the last few days, we've seen protests like these um, coming up across the US following the Supreme Court's decision to overturn a woman's right to have an abortion. Many fear it could be the tip of the iceberg and lead to other rulings being reversed, such as the legislation of same-sex marriage just a few years ago. So, to discuss this further, we'll be joined tomorrow by Sir Robert Buckland. He's a Conservative MP and barrister who was also the Solicitor General for England and Wales to get both his political, legal and personal take on this landmark moment in US politics. That's coming up tomorrow here on the programme. Meantime, today, looking at some of today's other headlines for you, Ghislaine Maxwell is expected to be sentenced in the US today following her conviction on five counts of sex trafficking. The 60-year-old was found guilty in December of grooming and recruiting vulnerable underage girls for wealthy paedophile Jeffrey Epstein. At least three people have died and a number of others have been injured after a passenger train collided with a lorry in the US on Monday afternoon. The train was travelling from Los Angeles to Chicago when it derailed in rural Missouri with 255 people on board. Britney Spears' ex-husband Jason Alexander has appeared at a preliminary hearing charged with felony stalking after he tried to storm her wedding to third husband Sam Ashgari earlier this month. The 40-year-old's public defender argued charges should be lessened to a misdemeanour because there was insufficient evidence that Alexander was there to harm the pop star. Boris Johnson's legislation to scrap parts of the Northern Ireland Protocol has cleared its first Commons hurdle. The bill passed by 295 to 221 votes, despite attracting fierce criticism from a number of MPs on the Tory benches as well as the opposition. Sighs of relief all round this morning after Britain's Andy Murray, Emma Raducanu and Cameron Norrie all made it through to the second round at Wimbledon. Good morning, Jackie. 
Good morning, Kay. Yes, I am back down in the queue this morning and it takes a lot of commitment, obviously, to go and see Andy Murray play tennis. And I've got a very committed family here from Glasgow, the Malloy family. And not only have you queued um, overnight and all of today to see Murray tomorrow, you also queued yesterday because you thought you might get in and you didn't get a high enough ticket. So you thought, I might as well wait and be front front for the next time. Right, yeah. How much do you love Andy Murray? We love him. We're so excited to be here. Um, it's Connor's first time getting to see him. So we've waited till he was old enough to be able to come here and camp. And this year's the year he's got yeah. through and we're so excited. And, and what did you think of him yesterday? And, and did you manage to watch a bit of Emma as well? And what did you think of her? Oh, I think she's really, you know, she's really calm as a player. She, she controls the ball really well. I think she could really progress as a tennis player. She oh, could do really And what well. about Andy with his metal hit? Oh. What, what about his game oh, yesterday? He moved so well. I, th I was really surprised when I was watching how, how well he moved around the court. And, you know, the fact that he had an injury and things like that, it's just crazy how good he was. You know, I was surprised, to oh, be honest. That'll, that'll be you one day, inspirational, <laughs> when you're 35 out there, Connor. Very good player, Connor. Um, what are you going to do all day? I mean, how do you kill the time? My plan is to sleep, but he's got other plans. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. We'll see. Enjoy well, the sun, yes, enjoy the sun. enjoy yourselves. And you're going to be right at the front for, for Murray tomorrow, so, yes, it'll be worth it. To, tomorrow will be worth it. They're all collecting bits and pieces, because when people go in and leave their tents, they can't be bothered to stack it, so they just give it away. So they've got loads of chairs, that family. Uh, let's see what these folk over here are doing. Um, queuing for tomorrow as well. Who, who do you want to see? Who wants to talk? Murray! Murray? Yeah, Murray. Are you, are you a fan? Do you think he can, even with the metal hip, can go can go deep in the tournament this time? Round four. They meet, he meets, I think, Sinner in round four. Well, he could beat Sinner, can't he? Oh, of course he can. Then he plays Novak in the quarters. That's uh, the dream draw. That, that is the dream, that is the dream draw. Um, the fact that he he's so used to centre court, he loves it, he soaks up the atmosphere, it almost is an extra few points, isn't it? Well, it's, a new, it's a set, not, no, not points. It's a set. The way he played last night, the last yeah. set is brilliant. Yeah. And what, and what about Emma Raducanu? We were all a bit I'm nervous. With a new, with a new, I'm having one next month. If I can move, I, I am. Yeah. If I You'll move, be out there next year then. I can move like him. I'm playing next year. Yeah. <laughs> even even at my age. <laughs> and just one word, because we're out of time. Emma Raducanu. Good effort from her as well. Great effort, but she needs to improve. Very high standards there. <laughs> Personally, I thought she, I thought she was very very good yesterday. It was a, a tough. Yes, it was. It was a very tough draw and a relief that she got through it. Plenty of Brits in action today as well. In fact, 12 of them. Thanks, Jackie. Now, Nicola Sturgeon is expected to say Scots must be given the democratic choice they voted for. She lays out plans today for how a second independence referendum could take place. Here's what the minister, Chris Philp, told me this morning. I think Nicola Sturgeon should respect the will of the Scottish people that was expressed so clearly in that referendum and not, and well, it's not once in a generation um, and, and um, respect the will of the people in that referendum and focus on the key issues that matter. In, in Scotland, the top issues were the economy, health and education. Uh, those are the issues, frankly, that both the UK government and actually the Scottish government, because health and education are completely devolved to the Scottish government, they should be focusing on those issues. You know, Scotland has the highest rate of uh, drug-related deaths in Europe. Joining us now is SNP's Fiona Hislop. Um, um, hello to you, Ms Hislop. Thank you for joining us on the programme. Concentrate on the issues that you've got in your front yard rather than an Indy Ref 2. Well, the cost of living is affecting everybody. And, of course, Brexit, the, the Scottish people didn't vote for, remember we voted to remain as part of the European Union, is exa you know, exacerbating inflation rates. So uh, control over econ the economy, uh, control over macroeconomic factors, and also control over social security are all part of the be bread and butter of independence. So the reason we need independence is so that we can actually address some of these issues. And if you look at the United Kingdom compared to, compared to countries across Europe, um, it performs very badly in terms of poverty, in income inequality, it's got the lowest rates of productivity and it's got the lowest GDP per population. So actually giving Scotland the opportunity to address challenges, which we know they are, uh, would be very good and, and, a, and a very positive step. So actually the addressing issues is exactly what independence is about. It's about making sure that we have a healthier, fairer, uh, fairer and indeed happier country. Uh, yeah, but it's not going to happen, is it? Because you need permission from uh, UK government. 
Uh, we need permission from the people of Scotland, and we got that permission in 2021 in the Scottish elections. Indeed, the leader of the Conservatives himself, Douglas Ross in Scotland, said, if you vote SNP at the Scottish Parliament elections, you're voting to have a referendum on independence. And guess what? The people of Scotland said yes. So we are respecting democracy. We are respecting the will of the people of Scotland because they voted quite clearly in a manifesto, an election that was very, very clear that what would happen if an SNP government was elected, that we would have an independence referendum. And that's about democracy and choice. We will have a lawful referendum. Uh, we respect the rule of law. We think that's really important. And that of course comes the day after a former Prime Minister actually accused the current UK government of breaking international law. So we are the respecters of democracy and we are the respecters of the rule of law. That may be the case, but you still need permission from the UK government. Well, the ideal situation is one where we have agreement between the UK government and the Scottish government. It's not the only way forward and we expect to hear from the First Minister later today what her plans are in the absence of, of that. But remember, this is about politics and I think the, the Scottish Conservatives, the UK Conservatives, must look very, very hard at a leader that continually stands his face against the will of the people of Scotland. And if they were so confident about their position, why don't they put it to the people of Scotland. Circumstances have changed completely since 2014 and we have businesses in Scotland who want to have access to the biggest single market in the world with the European Union single market and have the opportunity to trade there. Why are they denying the people of Scotland, the businesses of Scotland, the opportunity to be successful? Yeah, without Section 30, any referendum would not be legally binding and even with Section 30, a referendum is not legally binding. So any referendum that is held, including, for example, the Brexit referendum, uh, is one where, uh, because there is no constitution in the United Kingdom, it would be a part of that negotiation uh, going forward in terms of the type, the form, and indeed the uh, discussions on negotiations and independence. That would follow from a referendum, uh, and that is the responsibility of the UK government. Um, as would be expected by countries across the world, looking at the UK, how they respond to the democratic will of the people of Scotland. So there's the, the process of asking the people of Scotland, getting the permission of the people of Scotland, and then the following step would be the negotiation with the United Kingdom government. And it would be very, very hard for any government anywhere in the world to stand against a referendum that has been lawfully held and has it had the expressed will. How would it be lawful? How could it be lawfully held if you need to get permission well, from the British well, government on the Section I, 30? Well, why don't you tune in and hear the First Minister's statement? I'm not a member of the government I, and I'm looking forward to hearing the steps that she will set out and that's precisely what she's going to do in what will be a highly significant statement on the future of Scotland and the choice for the people of Scotland with independence. So she would break the law? No, she's made it quite clear that she would act lawfully. Uh, I think if you look to the UK government, you have a prime minister that has broken the law. You have uh, a, a government that's prepared to break international law with what it's doing in the Northern Ireland Protocol. We believe, and one of the reasons we want to be independent is because we want to live in a country that respects the rule of law, respects democracy, and that's what we're going to do. So I think if you want to question the illegality of any government, you should be looking to the UK government under the leadership of Boris Johnson. Last week, um, Nicola Sturgeon said the SNP's Westminster Group had questions to answer over its handling of the harassment complaint against the former Chief Whip, uh, Patrick Grady. Um, to what extent do you agree that the original investigation wasn't handled appropriately? Well, I don't have the, the detail of it, but clearly it hasn't been handled properly. That's a matter, obviously, for the Westminster Group and also for the Scottish National Party at its national level. But I think respect in the workplace is a, a really important um, aspect of any operation, whether it's a political party or other. And I think there are investigations ongoing, so therefore I would be limited in what I should say, uh, particularly on television. What questions does he have to... Uh, what questions does the group have to answer? Well, it's up for the group to answer how they deal with their staff and MSP, uh, MP relations. I'm not part of that group. I think it would be inappropriate for me to tell them what to do, but I think they'll be looking very long and hard. And I think a process that looks at how they handle things is, is the right thing to do. But you acknowledge that it was um, uh, not handled appropriately? Well, I haven't got the detail of that, but from everything that I'm aware of, it was inappropriate. And I think it's been acknowledged as that by the leader of the, the, the SNP group in Westminster. And I think um, if he's acknowledging that, then that must be the case. 
OK, good to talk to you. Thanks for joining us on the programme this morning. Thank you. Chairman of the Scottish Conservative Party, Craig Hoy, is with us now. Hello to you, Mr Hoy. You've just been hearing what the SNP say. Morning. Um, legally, Nicola Sturgeon can hold another independence referendum. I don't think that's the case uh, at all. Uh, we have to wait to hear what the First Minister says today. Two weeks ago, she came forward with the first announcement, and that was a bit of a damp squib. So she's come back at, before we go into recess at the end of this week to try and re-energise her flagging campaign. But uh, we uh, know what the uh, the situation is in terms of the Scottish Parliament's powers. Uh, the power to hold uh, a legally binding referendum uh, is reserved uh, to Westminster. We do not believe uh, this is the time for an independence referendum. We should be focused on the people's priorities. We should be focusing on uh, tackling the global cost of living crisis, on helping Scotland's uh, failing NH uh, NHS uh, recover, and dealing with many of the problems that have set in over the last 15 years under the SNP. So now is clearly not the time for a referendum. And also, that's the view of the Scottish people, because only uh, six, only for, uh, three in 10 uh, Scots uh, say they would like to hold an another independence referendum next year. That's clearly not uh, the people's priority. But Nicola Sturgeon can't help herself with her independence SNP obsession. Disagree. As you know, the SNP disagree with you on that one. And actually, there isn't anything you can do to stop them holding a referendum. It may not be legally binding, but if the people of Scotland, as part of that referendum, say that they want to break up the union, that's um, that would be very difficult for the Prime Minister to ignore. Look, we're getting into a very interesting territory here. If the SNP are proposing to hold some form of consultative or wildcat or illegal referendum, it's quite clear that the Scottish people don't want another independence referendum next year. Let's wait and see what the First Minister says this afternoon. Uh, it's not for me to write her plan B. We don't want another independence referendum. We're on the side of the majority of Scots on that. So it's now out uh, down uh, to the First Minister and the SNP to set out what it is uh, they're planning. Planning, but some kind of gimmick fake referendum, uh, I think, would bomb with the Scottish people. Why shouldn't there be a referendum? Look, we had a referendum in uh, 2014. Nicola Sturgeon told Scottish voters uh, last year that if they wanted to focus on the uh, recovery from the COVID pandemic and didn't want another independence referendum, they could still uh, safely vote for her. Um, and, and then immediately uh, she uh, is elected. And don't forget, she didn't get a majority uh, last year. She had to do a grubby backroom deal with the Greens in order to get a majority at Holyrood. And now that she has that, she's saying that there's somehow uh, the settled will of the Scottish people is for another independence referendum when every single opinion poll and also last year's Scottish parliamentary election uh, flatly contradicts that. Why are you using such inflammatory language, Mr Hoy? What, what do you want the SNP to take away from that? I'm not using uh, in, inflammatory well, talking language. about something being grubby and saying that it's illegal. Well, any any referendum uh, that, that didn't have a Section 30 uh, order uh, to underpin it could potentially be illegal. If the First Minister has contrary legal advice um, and 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 or, or, or an alternative uh, route uh, map to another independence referendum, she should bring that forward. Um, a few weeks ago, she was pressed uh, by the Information Commissioner to release uh, the legal advice that she had, and she couldn't point to a, a single shred of uh, evidence to say that the Scottish Parliament could hold uh, a referendum akin to that that we had in 2014. And I think that's the other fundamental element here is that we had uh, a referendum in 2014. It was agreed between the UK government and the Scottish government to have that referendum. And by a significant margin, we voted to remain in the UK. And that was for, not at our behest, at the uh, SNP's behest, that was a once in a generation uh, referendum. So I think the issue needs to be parked so that we can focus on the people's priorities. Uh, and, and clearly, the biggest priority, I think, as, as it is across the rest of the UK, is to deal with the effects of the global cost of living crisis, but also to tackle, I think, as we heard earlier from our, our colleague at Westminster, to deal with some of those really big issues that Scotland faces under the SNP. The, uh, the, the record OK, we know what they are, because you said they've already mentioned them. Um, talk to me about, given that you're so confident that the uh, Scottish people don't want to be independent, why not have a referendum and prove it? Because I think a referendum would be deeply damaging. It was very divisive in this country in 2014, and some of those uh, uh, wounds have yet uh, to heal. It would be very, very damaging uh, to the Scottish economy, and it would also mean that the Scottish government took its eye off the ball for the next 12 or 18 months when we should be focusing on those very pressing issues, uh, the cost of living crisis being one and the uh, recovering from the COVID pandemic being the other. It's exactly not what Scotland uh, needs right now. And I think that's why six and 10 Scots are opposed to it. 
Uh, pressure continuing to grow on the Prime Minister, Douglas Ross, um, been, uh, leader, of course, has been flip-flopping over whether or not he um, still supports Boris Johnson. Where are you? I think Douglas Ross has been perfectly clear. He set out at the beginning of the year uh, his conditions as to um, whether he could or couldn't uh, support the Prime Minister. I'm the chairman of the Conservative Party. I'm not prepared, to, uh, here in Scotland, I'm not prepared to uh, provide a running commentary on it, but I did see what my colleague uh, Oliver uh, Dowden said uh, last week. I think the Prime Minister, the Cabinet and colleagues at Westminster need to reflect on where we are, because those were two deeply disappointing uh, by-election results um, last week. But it will be for colleagues at Westminster to determine what happens next. Yeah, do you support the Prime Minister? I support the Prime Minister to get on with the job of uh, governing uh, the UK. I and many of my colleagues have expressed significant disquiet about the events that we've seen coming out of Downing Street. And as I say, uh, there is a period of reflection ahead. I think the Prime Minister uh, should be reflecting uh, on those results as well. But I'm not going to provide a running commentary day by day in relation to that. Clearly, Douglas Ross has, uh, set out his position. I understand he, that. Is he still the best man for the job? Um, I'm not prepared to say whether he's the best man for the job or not. Again, that's a colleague, uh, for colleagues at Westminster to determine. What I would say, though, is that I think the anger that the uh, Scottish people and uh, people across the UK um, uh, clearly felt uh, at the events in Downing Street uh, was made very clear during the uh, local elections. It was made very clear um, uh, at the by-elections last week. And I think uh, that there is a, a, a need for number 10 for the Prime Minister, for colleagues at Westminster to reflect upon that. We must leave it there. Good to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Tamara's here. Morning. Morning, Kay. Well, yes, Nicola Sturgeon will be setting out to members of the Scottish Parliament this afternoon what her case is for a second independence referendum and how she's going to do it in a way that would be legal. We know that she has been uh, setting out her campaign uh, for this second referendum after uh, she and the former leader Alex Salmond said the last one eight years ago was a once in a generation, once in a lifetime referendum, as the Scottish Conservatives often point out. They will need to find a way to do it legally, given that Boris Johnson and his predecessors as Prime Minister have refused to allow uh, them to have a second independence referendum. There's some suggestions that she's found a legal wheeze around it by asking a different question, like whether the Scottish people would give her a mandate to explore the issue of independence. There may be a way to do it in a way that is advisory but would put pressure on the UK government. This is what we'll hear from her this afternoon. But certainly, she's been under pressure since the Holyrood elections about a year ago when the SNP, together with the Green Party, also pro-independence, um, had a majority in the Scottish Parliament to set out how she is going to make this happen. But what's so interesting is that since that referendum, which um, we both covered back in 2014, really the polls about how people feel about independence in Scotland haven't really moved. You've had 23 polls in the last year, of which three have had a slight majority for independence independence. Most of them have had a majority for the union. So um, yes, she's going to be setting out how she's going to make this happen. But is there masses of appetite in Scotland uh, for a second independence referendum that there wasn't before? The polls don't suggest that it's moved very much. OK, thanks very much for now. Tomorrow's take at nine o'clock. Looking forward to it. Thanks so much indeed. Uh, we were speaking to the government minister just a short time ago, asking him about the bombing of the shopping centre in Ukraine and whether that should be considered as an act of terror. I think the attacks that Russia is carrying out on civilian targets clearly, deliberately, are just sickening and appalling. We saw the attack just there on a shopping centre yesterday, but it's not a one-off. We've seen them over the last three months attacking uh, children's hospitals. We've seen them attacking maternity wings. We've seen them bombing flats. There is apparently no end to the barbarity of Putin's, frankly, criminal regime. Is it an act of terrorism, what we saw yesterday? Uh, I would go, yes, I would go that far and say that it is, because it is intentionally targeting civilians. There is no military necessity to bombing a shopping centre, just as there was no military necessity to bombing a maternity hospital, which we saw, um, or that theatre in uh, Mariupol. We saw them bombing that theatre where civilians were taking shelter. It was clearly marked as containing civilians. So um, this is not a one-off act. It's part of a consistent pattern uh, of, of atrocities being committed by the Russian government. As former Deputy Assistant Secretary General for Emerging Security Challenges, that's Dr Jamie Shea, is joining us now. Hello to you, Doctor. Thank you for joining us on the programme this morning. Do you feel it was also an act of terrorism? 
Uh, good morning, Kay. Thanks for having me on the programme. I, I think it has the potential to be that. I mean, obviously, this is for international lawyers to decide, and there are many investigations which are now being carried out uh, into war crimes uh, uh, committed by uh, Russia. Lots of evidence is being gathered. The, the Ukrainians have already started some trials against Russian uh, soldiers. Uh, so, yes, this is certainly a, a tactic uh, to directly target uh, civilians. Uh, it's also a tactic to terrorise the civilian population. And I think it's Putin's way of sort of showing that, yes, although we've had to refocus our military effort on the Donbass because we weren't successful in uh, capturing Kiev or Kharkiv in the early stages, we still have this sort of intention of uh, destroying uh, Ukraine. Uh, and even if our troops can't get to Kiev, our, our missiles certainly can. Um, we're hearing that uh, the NATO Defence Force will be increased from 40,000, the rapid deployment, to uh, something like 300,000. What message is that sending to Russia? Well, NATO uh, is having a summit uh, in, in Madrid today, and uh, it's also going to issue a so-called new strategic concept, a new NATO vision statement for the next 10 years. And what's really significant, Kay, about this new document is it no longer describes Russia as a strategic partner, uh, as the older concept did, but as a direct uh, and significant threat. And therefore, NATO is sort of regearing itself to deal with a much higher uh, degree of, uh, uh, of uh, anticipation of a possible Russian attack. Um, and therefore, it wants to take its uh, forces that are on a high state of alert, you know, the pool of forces that it can draw upon immediately if it has to sort of maintain or, or mount some kind of defence, from the current level of 40,000 to 300,000. But, Kay, you've got to remember there are 1.6 million soldiers in Europe uh, under the NATO flag. So asking for only one fifth of those uh, to be in a high state of readiness is, is not really asking too much. What do you make about the suggestions that we're going to be hearing from the, the new head of the army later on suggesting this is our 1937 moment? What do you think he means by that? Well, you know, historical analogies play out to some degree and don't play out to uh, other degrees. But 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 certainly we, we are dealing with uh, a classical sort of creeping aggression uh, by Putin, starting uh, in Georgia in 2008, then extending to uh, Ukraine in 2014, when obviously Russia annexed Crimea and came into the Donbass now more broadly uh, uh, throughout Ukraine. Uh, we know uh, clearly that Russia has designs on the Baltic states. Uh, uh, Putin compared himself to Peter the great, uh, the Tsar who expanded the Russian Empire, particularly in the Baltics, just a couple of days ago. So whether, the, you know, the Hitler analogy of not giving in uh, to uh, uh, threats, uh, not uh, uh, obviously giving in to appeasement, uh, being prepared to draw a line in the sand, whether that analogy applies, I'll, I'll leave that to the historians. But, but clearly, you've got to say that a, NATO, a Russian threat against NATO, which was extremely low probability before the February the 24th, has now become much higher probability, not inevitable but higher probability, and NATO therefore has to take its deterrence from a rather sort of minimal level to much greater war-fighting rapid reaction uh, uh, level, uh, much more focused on the borders, not conceding any territory, and that's the reason behind this increase from 40,000 to 300,000 troops that would be a, a, a fairly high state of readiness to move quickly. Russia threat to NATO, what does that look like? Well, at, at the moment, it takes diverse forms. Uh, for example, uh, uh, we've seen uh, Lithuania, which just a couple of days ago bravely uh, imposed uh, EU sanctions by blocking uh, uh, still uh, 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 imports from Russia into Kaliningrad across its territory. We've seen Lithuania yesterday uh, being the victim of uh, quite uh, major cyber attacks against its government department. So it can take that form. NATO causes hybrid warfare. It can be, you know, in interfering in elections as in the United States a few years ago. It, it can be selected assassinations using highly dangerous toxic weapons, as we in the UK experienced in Salisbury a few years ago. So Russia has a whole sort of toolbox of different forms, uh, short of, of course, an outright military aggression. But, but Putin is somebody who obviously believes in the use of force to dictate political outcomes. And you cannot exclude that that f f could spill over from a Ukrainian conflict onto NATO territory. So NATO also has to have a sort of toolbox uh, from low to high to be able to deal with uh, that, 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 that level of the Russian threat. And by the 
way, it, and particularly as the NATO summit is meeting in Madrid, there's also going to be a look at what Russia is up to in Africa across the Mediterranean, where its Wagner mercenaries have been very active indeed in trying to sort of curtail Western influence in places like Mali, the Central African Republic, Libya, uh, Syria, of course, and, and so on. So it's multidimensional. It takes different forms, and NATO has to has to have a sophisticated approach to be able to respond in the appropriate way. Fascinating stuff, Doctor. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just before we let you go this hour, um, when you own a small pub in Somerset, you never know who might pop in. <laughs> <laughs> Where's your name again? Hannah. 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 Uh, Jeremy. Jeremy. You're getting married in a minute. In, no, 28th of August. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, like, he is doing yeah. the food. Figurative yeah. minute. Well, that's yeah, Al Alfie's, <laughs> Alfie's piano. <laughs> 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 Alfie's piano. <laughs> Pick it up. Film taking over a family pub's piano to play a rendition of his uh, band's hit, A Sky Full of Stars, to a happy couple looking ahead to their wedding day. Not a bad way to start the celebrations. Um, all today's top stories coming up for you in just a few moments' time here on Sky News, including the uh, situation in Ukraine and a terrible incident in Texas. That's coming in just a moment. Stay tuned. <laughs>